Um, I'm Rich Wagner. Uh, I have been uh, helping uh, Pony and CSIS conduct a series of seminars, workshops on the intersection between technology and strategy. Um, the intersection between those two as it relates to large-scale strategic issues of which nuclear is one, of course. Um, and this is, a, this is, in some sense, uh, a part of that series. Um, Airland Battle is a story that I think has not been well documented. Uh, more important, I think, uh, to what happened during the Cold War and to our understanding of extended deterrence in general uh, than, um, than the extent to which it has or has not been treated in, in the histories uh, might indicate. So I thought it would be useful before um, too much more memory of airland battle is lost uh, for us to, us old guys, yeah, uh, for us to spend a little time on that subject. Uh, NATO, NATO experience uh, of extended deterrence, as we call it today, is the only real experience of successful extended deterrence in the nuclear age that exists. And so we'd better learn as many lessons from it as we can because we're going to have to extend. We are extending deterrence. We're going to have to do it for a long time, uh, and we need to learn those lessons. Uh, my colleague Jim Tegnelia and I both lived through the Airland battle story. Um, not either of us, I think, perhaps right at the center of it, but close enough to it to have seen different parts of it. Uh, I was uh, at Livermore during the 70s, um, helping design, leading some of the design programs, um, and then went to the Pentagon in 81 and was there for the first six years of the, of the Reagan administrations, uh, when in some ways uh, the airland battle strategy uh, came to its fullest form and was fully implemented by, by uh, NATO. Um, and then uh, during the rest of the 80s, uh, after I left the Pentagon, I was still connected in three or four ways, one of which was uh, being the American co-chair of a, what today we would call a track two uh, German-American working group on European conflict and deterrence. Uh, so I was, I was uh, involved in this for probably 20 years. Um, Jim, let me let you introduce yourself before we go any farther. Well, good morning, everybody. I, uh, make sure everybody's here. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Tignoia. Let me just give you a little bit of a background. First of all, I'm an Army veteran during the 60s. Um, I'll tell you a vignette about uh, one of my Army training days. I was in a quartering party, and uh, <clears throat> we were doing what we had to do to set up command headquarters. And the fellow says, at 0 100, there's going to be a nuclear simulation. <laughs> And what they did was they did these, uh, they were basically napalm things. And they simulated what they said was a Davy Crockett, which was 500 tons worth of. And uh, let me just tell you that it scared the hell out of everybody. And it shut down all the operations that we were doing. And I said, you know, um, in my day, every, divi every platoon had a Davy Crockett. It was the shoulder-fired individual weapon. And uh, we had munitions from what are called ADMs, hand-carried things, all the way up to Davy Crockett's to artillery, and everybody had a nuclear weapon. And you could just tell when you were on the ground here, that can't be the way we're going to wage war. There are going to be too many people killed. This thing can't possibly work this way. Well, I, I spent a year in Vietnam, separated from the military, worked for the Army Laboratory System, uh, and then eventually in DARPA, and I had um, eight years in DARPA, which is now no longer allowed, but it used to happen in those days. And I had every technical position you could have in DARPA, ending up with um, uh, ending up being the acting director. In that job, I set up the stealth office, which was the key one of the key elements which we'll talk about in Airland Battle the technology part of it. I also ran the JSTARS initiators, an important part of what turned out to be Airland Battle. Uh, 
And we did a thing called a salt breaker, <clears throat> which was a, a demonstration program of extended range precision guided munitions, which also became part of air land battle. And so my history with air land battle was I first of all came up with the thought that we need to really think about a different way to do this. And the second thing was I was involved with the technology um, associated with air land battle. I finished my career in DITRA and as a member of the Sandia staff. And I'll draw some messages. Um, this is a fact. <clears throat> the biggest, uh, uh, if you will, organization that was not in favor of air land battle was Sandia. And the, um, and the uh, presentation c committees always had thought it was good sport to have me come up and talk about air land battle and what the technology could do and they'd get Sandia to come up and tell everybody why that was such a bad idea. So I kind of know, uh, I kind of know it from, from both sides. I've been in the DOE labs, been in DO, and DOD. And I think it's, as, as Rich does, I think it's a, it's a significant activity, uh, a study in the merger, in the union, the logical union, of policy, doctrine, operations, and technology. And, and when those three things, policy, operations, and technology, get in resonance, in amplification, some really interesting thing happened. And the purpose of my talk will be to try to give you a sense of what that resonance turned out to be in airland battle, where some of the words came from and who some of the players were. That's an extended introduction, but uh, it's nice to be here. So I'll speak with view graphs because I don't know the story as well as Jim does, and Jim's going to speak without view graphs because he's got it all down pat and can do that. Um, so um, I'll advance the slide. So I just want to set, this, set the stage with three or four points about the way the world developed there before 1970, before some of you were born. Um, Wars of NATO and Warsaw Pact were in place. Europe was partitioned. The Iron Curtain was as Winston Churchill had said, descended over Europe, uh, across the middle of Europe, um, as a relic from World War II, not a relic, um, a, uh, a continuation in some sense of the, of the end of World War II, there were massive Soviet, uh, Warsaw Pact uh, armored forces on the inter-German border, and that was the threat. That was the immediate local threat. Um, NATO had been established and was struggling with how to deal with that threat. Uh, in about 1958, I may be off for a couple of years, by a couple of years, uh, uh, NATO issued and adopted the Harmel Report, which said, uh, in a sense, that the, the most important thing for the alliance is to continue the economic growth and, and the path to prosperity that the Marshall Plan had uh, initiated in, uh, in reconstituting uh, Europe, uh, and that in order to do that, the NATO nations would be handicapped if they had to spend as much money on conventional forces as that might be required to, to counter the Warsaw Pact conventional forces. So they said NATO ought to rely on nuclear weapons. Um, partly in response to that, um, uh, the U.S. had uh, continued its forward deployment of conventional forces in Europe and had deployed what we often call tactical nuclear weapons, battlefield nuclear weapons in Europe. Um, and um, nuclear weapons had come to be thought of as, and this was often uh, said in those words, the glue that holds NATO together. But in fact, there was a lot of controversy about nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are controversial. And, uh, uh, and that wasn't entirely an apt simile because in some ways uh, uh, nuclear weapons were as much a source of contention as a source of confidence in, in NATO. And that's part of the story. So the situation in about 1970 was that West Germany, if it had not been the fulcrum of the early days, had become the fulcrum of the Cold War. Uh, they were the front line. Uh, you remember that Germany was divided into the Federal Republic of German and the German Democratic Republic uh, east of the, east of the uh, Iron Curtain. Um, the Soviets had achieved parity and near, or near parity, uh, effective parity in intercontinental weapons and in homeland deterrence. Uh, that issue uh, was in some sense off the table, although it continued as, a, as an important one for many decades. Uh, the Russians were obsessed with Germany, uh, had been for centuries probably uh, in various ways, uh, but their memories of World War II were 
were uh, uh, recent and intense. Uh, and the Soviets adopted a, a strategy of threats and enticements, uh, with, especially with regard to Germany, whose objective, and the objective of that strategy was to undermine the cohesion of, of NATO. If they could do that, they'd win without having to fight. Um, the threats were the military threats, and the enticements, uh, to oversimplify it a lot, uh, were that uh, they had something the West Germans wanted, which was East Germany, their cousins in East Germany. Uh, it had been a German political objective uh, for a long time to reunify German, Germany. That wasn't going to happen unless the Soviets allowed it. Uh, so the Germans uh, were of two minds. Uh, stick with NATO in order to protect themselves from the Soviets or make some kind of, a, of an arrangement uh, with the Soviets in order to affect the reunification of Germany. Um, NATO's nuclear weapons strategy was very difficult, however. Um, it entailed at the time, in about, let's say, 1970, the massive use of uh, NATO nuclear weapons on German West German territory if deterrence failed um, in order to... Uh, deal with the uh, many, uh, the, the dozens of armored divisions coming across the border, um, it would require massive battlefield use of nuclear weapons to stop them. Um, because that was sort of the only level at which nuclear weapons uh, uh, might be used, uh, there was a big gap uh, where we lacked escalation control um, between that and the strategic level, and that meant that there was problematic coupling to, uh, to the strategic level, which was important uh, uh, also for deterrence. Uh, in order to uh, function as a, an alliance of democracies, uh, consultation on nuclear matters uh, was uh, one, of the, one of the fundamental principles of NATO, and that meant consultation on deployments and peacetime, consultation on how you would act um, in a crisis, and consultation on how you might use nuclear weapons in wartime. That kind of consultation um, and, and, and the fact that it, that it had to be somewhat deliberate, it couldn't be a pre-delegated, pre-arranged um, uh, tripwire sort of thing. It required, it, it, the, so, the, so the thinking went, at least a few days to assess what the nature of the attack would be, where the conventional forces could hold out, and for how long, and whether and how to use nuclear weapons. And the, and the nuclear weapon uh, posture uh, did not allow that. Another thing that caused uh, uh, concern about nuclear weapons in NATO during those years was the terrorist threat to nuclear weapons based in, in uh, NATO nations. Uh, because the nuclear weapons had to be ready to be used quickly, they were based uh, in the field, uh, close to where they might have to be used, and thus, and because there were many places where they were sighted, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the weapons were vulnerable uh, to terrorist attack. Remember that in those days, we think of terrorism as a new thing, but in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was a lot of terrorism going on in Western Europe, especially West Germany. Uh, in 1982, I think it was, the U.S. Air Force Europe headquarters at Ramstein Air Base was almost destroyed by a car bomb. Uh, General Dozier was kidnapped by terrorists. Uh, my good friend, uh, the, the head of uh, U.S. Army Europe, Fritz Croson, uh, was severely injured in a car bomb attack directed directly at him. Uh, there was some evidence at the time that these same kinds of terrorist groups uh, had designs on nuclear weapons, uh, U.S. nuclear weapons stored in, in Europe to, under, to, to, to expose their vulnerability and, and inflame the, uh, uh, the concern about the nuclear weapons uh, on the part of the, of the publics. Um, a partial response that um, developed during the, during the 1970s to that difficult situation was to propose and then to some small extent to deploy the uh, enhanced radiation battlefield nuclear weapons, uh, plus improved conventional armor, anti-armor. And I'll explain the synergy between those two in the next slide. Um, uh, this was a controversial proposal. Um, the uh, West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who was a Social Democrat, uh, the, the two parties were the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, uh, on the left and on the right, respectively, um, 
much of the uh, public concern about the nuclear weapon posture was uh, was uh, centered in the in the social democrats of which schmidt was one but he in a courageous move and you'll see another courageous move in a minute um, accepted uh, the the, uh, the proposed deployment of er weapons which was then a year or two later canceled by jimmy carter uh, largely because of concern that uh, uh, well who knows but uh, as i remember it um, uh, that uh, the ability to use nuclear weapons on a battlefield might make them more usable. Uh, but as we understood after the Cold War was over, the Soviets understood that even though we did not deploy many, um, that they were latent and could be perhaps deployed quickly. And so they played a role even beyond the size of the actual deployments. NATO adopted a, a posture of what was called flexible response, uh, which was an ambiguity that was in part intended to keep the Soviets from understanding how we would actually fight if deterrence failed, uh, but also partly to, uh, to help uh, NATO uh, avoid uh, having to endorse a particular approach which might be, might be controversial. Uh, there were some initiated by, by Johnny Foster and Jack Howard and President Kennedy uh, and others. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, there were some improvements in the security of forward-based nuclear weapons, um, which helped with the uh, the concern about uh, their vulnerability to terrorist attacks, um, but as we'll see in a minute, didn't go didn't go far enough for a couple of reasons. Uh, I'll digress a little bit on enhanced radiation uh, weapons. It, uh, to the extent that they're remembered at all, um, people remember them as being weapons that would kill people and not destroy buildings. Uh, that was not the way they were conceived in our understanding of how they would play on the on the anti-armor battlefield. On the left is a diagram of a radius of effects uh, with conventional nuclear weapons and less capable non-nuclear anti-armor. Uh, if the lethal area against personnel and tanks is the red circle, uh, then uh, the standoff distance that conventional anti-armor, NATO anti-armor forces had to stay away is the large circle on the left the capability of conventional NATO anti-armor uh, in the late 60s was not great. So the shaded area was the area that could be neither handled by nuclear weapons or by conventional anti-armor. What uh, uh, longer ranged conventional anti-armor capability and the reduced uh, uh, sure safe distance uh, accomplished was to allow uh, Warsaw Pact armored forces, so went the story, to be uh, more effectively engaged with the use of many fewer nu nuclear weapons. In the left, in the left-hand side, one might have to cover the the uh, the gray area with uh, with nuclear weapons. On the right-hand side, you wouldn't have to do that. And so the the simulations that were carried out by the Army and Livermore and Sandia. Um, showed that perhaps one-tenth the number of nuclear weapons were going to be required to, uh, uh, to deal effectively, at least for a few days, with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the Warsaw Pact armor. In response to that, in part, I'm simplifying this story. It's a complicated story, and I'm conceptualizing it to some extent to get the basics across, uh, but recognize that it's undoubtedly more complicated than we can do justice to in, in a few slides in, in half an hour. Um, in part, in response to that, the Soviets adopted a strategy of echelonment and having, instead of having all their forces forward with a massive 100-mile-long uh, attack on the West, uh, to move their forces back uh, where they would be um, less vulnerable to a NATO-initiated uh, attack, perhaps a preemptive attack, which was a concern on the Soviets' part. Um, and also, they could... Uh, uh, see where the initial forward echelon might achieve, uh, uh, find a weakness, and then throw all of the forces that were stationed further behind the border into that place. So that was called echelonment, uh, and it, it in fact was a, a rather uh, uh, effective counter to NATO's uh, obsession with, the, with dealing with this massive uh, uh, forward-based forward uh, conventional force. Uh, 
Another part of this uh, was the Soviet deployment of short-range tactical ballistic missiles, um, uh, dozens of miles and hundreds of miles range, uh, which together with their special forces posed a special threat to the um, NATO nuclear weapons that were in these storage sites, um, and that threat posed a political problem for NATO, uh, that uh, in order to keep the weapons in the storage sites from being destroyed by Spetsnaz or short-range tactical missiles in the first hours of the, of the war, Can I tell them what Spetsnaz is? Spetsnaz is, is, is so, I, I've forgotten exactly what it stands for, it's Soviet Special Forces. Um, the um, uh, NATO would have to make a difficult decision to take those weapons out of their storage sites and disperse them in the countryside immediately. Uh, that was thought to be a difficult decision because it might be provocative. If the war hadn't gone nuclear by that time, it might indicate that NATO was intending to take it nuclear immediately, and that was uh, thought not to be a, a, a prudent position. Uh, so those threats to the storage sites were... Uh, were an important part of uh, undercutting NATO's uh, reliance on nuclear weapons. The deployment of SS-20s, the longer range uh, weapons that could reach uh, Western Europe from the Soviet Union, from deep in the Soviet Union, uh, is a story that is part of this, but I'll tell, I'll tell it, I'll mention a little bit more later. All of this was accompanied by um, a propaganda program in Western Europe um, to uh, reinforce the natural public concerns about being defended by nuclear weapons, uh, and especially during the 70s against uh, enhanced, rep uh, enhanced radiation weapons, and, um, and perhaps via some cutouts, uh, some uh, Soviet support to these terrorist groups uh, uh, that were thought to pose a threat to the, and, and perhaps did pose a threat to the, uh, to the storage sites. So that was the Soviet move. Uh, NATO's response, here we come to airland battle, which was developed in the mid-70s to the mid-80s, implemented in the, developed in the, in the 70s, and, and implemented in the early and mid-80s. And it consisted mainly of follow-on forces attack, uh, which consisted of two parts, to be able to see deep into the echelon, the deeper deployments, the echelon deployments of Warsaw Pact forces, and you did that, not only did you see, but you understood on the basis, you understood what you saw. You dis, you, the objective, which was achieved, in fact, we think, uh, in fact, we, it was achieved, um, was to discern the operational patterns of life uh, so that we could see, um, uh, both during peacetime and Soviet exer Warsaw Pact exercises, but also in war, uh, how the Soviets were, in fact, moving those uh, uh, rear-based forces forward to uh, exploit any early breakthroughs that they'd had, and then to be able to strike those forces before they could move forward or as they were moving forward, um, especially with uh, precision conventional weapons, but also with reduced collateral damage nuclear weapons. So reduced collateral damage has entered twice now, first in the enhanced radiation weapons on the in the anti-armor attack, and then here uh, uh, for striking uh, against the... Uh, uh, the Warsaw Pact forces moving forward uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, there was a political uh, a need to do that as well, because uh, now this war was going to be fought on Eastern European territory, uh, on uh, in particular East Germany, and uh, it was unacceptable in Germany to in Western Germany to think of threatening their cousins east of the border. Uh, so, so there were st uh, strict limits placed on. Uh, the kind of collateral damage that nuclear weapons w would be allowed to do in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we began to deploy, or at least talk about deploying, um, uh, defenses uh, against tactical ballistic missiles. In, in the late 70s, I chaired a Defense Science Board task force that recommended and resulted in a Patriot being given a, uh, uh, an anti-ballistic missile uh, capability and the the winning argument in the in the in the in the uh, assessment in the Pentagon was that uh, that was needed for this purpose, for this particular purpose, to allow the weapons to stay in garrison enough longer so that NATO could consult about the difficult decision of taking them out of garrison and moving them into the field where they'd be presumably more survivable. We also did 
a lot to improve uh, nuclear weapon, a lot more to improve nuclear weapon safety and security. Um, to some extent, with the help of President Reagan, uh, who intervened on a couple of crucial occasions with his uh, heads of state colleagues in Europe uh, to convince them to spend the money. Um, there was an interesting little uh, little twist on that. Uh, for some reason, uh, a number of NATO nations were unwilling to spend the money to harden the storage sites against terrorist attack. And it occurred to Fred Selleck, whom some of you know, um, that it would be, he was uh, an Air Force colonel in OSD policy at the time, that it might be useful to take uh, uh, NATO defense ministers to a storage site. And there is, there is, for many people, an aura about nuclear weapons uh, that has a, an impact on how they think. So we took the NATO ministers to, uh, to a storage site in, I think, Germany, maybe it was Holland, and they actually put their hands on nuclear weapons, NATO nuclear weapons. And that solved the problem. They endorsed, almost a day or two later, uh, spending the money to harden the storage sites. So little twists like that can make a difference, too. And that's a another aspect of the political dimension of this problem. So here were the problems solved by airland battle. It thwarted the Warsaw Pact echelon echelonment strategy. It considerably improved the politics of nuclear weapons in NATO. Uh, less prospective use of and damage from nuclear weapons, less used in West Germany, more time for consultation, improved escalation control because there were other options to better safety and security. And after the war was over, there, was, there were a lot of interviews with, uh, with uh, former Warsaw Pact military people uh, at a dinner in Bonn um, uh, between a few of us and a few of them. Um, one of them said to me, um, you know, we saw that we were out of options. Uh, when you deployed Airland Battle, um, we, weren't, we, we didn't see a move that we could make next that would work both the military problem and undermine your, uh, the political support for your deterrent strategy as we had hoped to do. They felt they were out of options. Um, the INF story is in some ways connected with this. It was going on at the same time. You could think of it as a, as a, uh, as a part of echelonment and certainly an, uh, an, an aspect of uh, uh, preventing a problem of coupling escalation to the strategic level because uh, the SS-20s could reach Western Europe from, from the sanctuary of the Soviet homeland, uh, which posed an escalation problem for us. Um, Helmut Schmidt, again, in a, in a courageous and somewhat counter-political uh, uh, decision on his part, uh, invited the deployment of long-range, it wasn't only he, but it was uh, the NATO nations in general, of, of long-range, longer-range uh, weapon systems in, in Germany and in NATO, uh, uh, our, our version of the, of the INF systems, the ground-launched cruise missile, the Pershing II, and improved long-range air. And then to work the, uh, uh, the political concern, remember the nuclear freeze movement was going on at the time, um, uh, we instituted this, uh, uh, this two-track approach of uh, continuing deployments plus negotiations, and the negotiations eventually led to the, to the INF Treaty. Um, I want to spend a second on how airland battle was developed, uh, because to some extent it was done behind the scenes um, until the ideas were ready, and it took it took years for the ideas to mature and the technologies, the technology base to be developed. Jim mentioned some of it, the stealth technology for penetrating air defenses and the surveillance technology from, uh, uh, from aircraft and other ways of looking deep into, into the Warsaw Pact territory. Um, Joe Braddock and General Don Starry um, connived starting in about 1970 uh, when Starry was uh, probably a lieutenant colonel, um, uh, to develop a cadre of co-conspirators who would uh, develop a strategy for dealing with NATO's deterrence problem in an effective way. Uh, they enlisted people, they enlisted a, perhaps a dozen or 20 people, 
Uh, Braddock made a good bet on Don Starry because Starry went on to get four stars and run the Army's Training and Doctrine Command at just the right time in the late 70s and early 80s so that the Army, by that time, with the ideas developed over 10 years by Braddock, Starry, Fred Wickner, Don Cotter, Albert Wolstetter, uh, others, uh, Jim and me a little bit, uh, Jim, I think more than I, although I did do some of the work at Livermore on how, convent, how collateral, reduced collateral damage nuclear weapons would play in the scheme, um, developed the ideas that I sketched out in the previous charts. DNA, the successor, the, the, the predecessor to, to DTRA, played an immensely important role. Um, it was almost a covert role. The, in those days, DNA was led by uh, a, a three-star general or admiral, um, and, and, uh, and they rotated every two or three years. Um, uh, the technical director was a man named Pete Haas, a Swiss uh, American, uh, naturalized American citizen, um, who was recruited by Braddock and Starry to fund, out of DNA funding, but not within DNA's charter. I mean, DNA wasn't chartered to solve the Cold War deterrence problem. DNA was chartered to do some more particular, narrower things. But Pete Haas became part of this of the Braddock Starry Cabal and funded companies uh, to develop the thinking about how this would all work, to do the systems analysis and military analysis studies. Um, that was easier for DNA to do in those days because the relationships with DNA, DNA's contractors, SAIC, Braddock's company, Braddock, Dunn, and McDonald, others, uh, was much more collegial. There was a group called SAGE, the advisory committee to the director of, D of DNA, which consisted of the CEOs of DNA contractors. They would get together every few months and decide what DNA's program ought to, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this some, decide what DNA's program to effect air land battle and other important things, advise the DNA director, here's how you should spend your money with us. And, and you know, I mean, he wasn't a pushover. He had brought some uh, independent thinking to it, but it largely happened. Uh, so it was much more collegial and much more effective. I've mentioned Don Starry's role in, in TRADOC, in being the commander of TRADOC at just the right time. Jim, I, I, I hadn't remembered that Sandia opposed uh, airland battle, but Sandia did do a lot of work on two kinds of technology. One, the technologies for improving the safety and security of the weapons forward deployed was pursued by, over decades, by a group of people at Sandia that knew not only the warhead technology, but, but, but everything about unauthorized launch, securing weapons from attack, uh, ensuring that there weren't ac accidents. Uh, Sandia had spent, um, perhaps because these guys were so insistent, had spent a lot of discretionary money, which the labs have almost none of now, to go down the false leads until they found out where the fruitful paths were, until they developed all of the technologies that were needed to vastly improve the security of nuclear weapons forward-based in these vulnerable places. Much of the work on precision strike and surveillance technology with Jim's leadership in DARPA was done within DOD. But Sandia was also helping to uh, to build the technology base for, uh, for doing that as well. So they played that role also. Uh, mo most of the development of the warheads, the nuclear package for the re reduced collateral damage weapons was done at Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore, and uh, well, and, and Sandia Livermore. Um, and uh, we also developed uh, uh, the warfare simulation codes in order to understand how collateral damage played on the combined arms battlefield. Um, that then became the Army's uh, uh, principal uh, warfare simulation uh, uh, simulations and uh, continued that way for at least 20 years. Um, the, the crucial um, step 
was convincing the supreme allied commanders in Europe that air land battle was the way to go. Uh, it was an uphill fight for a while, and uh, without General Starry at Tradoc, it would have probably failed. General Bernie Rogers uh, was the uh, sankier in the early 80s, and Bernie, um, <laughs> when I paid my courtesy call on Bernie Rogers when he first went to, went to shape, he closed the door, turned around, pounded his fist on his desk and said, no goddamn civilian weenie in OSD is going to tell me how to use my nuclear weapons. And we, we got along famously after that, and of course we did tell him how to use his nuclear weapons, but he added a lot to the idea and, and was the, really was the, uh, was the, uh, Bernie died a few years ago, I can tell that story now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he really was the, what made the crucial decisions that allowed it to be implemented in the early 80s. There was another thing that went on after Sankur's became convinced that really solidified um, airland battle and our confidence in our ability to do it. And that was a series of exercises called Shockwave, which um, were used in, in NATO... Uh, uh, war fighting exercises that were used in a clever way to elicit um, Warsaw Pact exercises in response that we could then validate our view of their operational patterns by watching. It was a very, very clever um, way of using exercises. So over the course of two or three cycles, we'd use, we'd, we'd structure the, the NATO exercises to explore this particular thing that we weren't quite sure we understood about how the Soviets would operate. And then they nicely would respond by uh, doing an exercise of their own that would reveal uh, a little more so that we could understand it better how they were operating. Uh, I hope we're doing that in other parts of the world today. So that's how our land battle was developed. I'm not sure we could do it again today. Uh, there's not the discretionary money. There is not the relationship between um, analytic thinkers and the people who fund them uh, today, I believe, that uh, would allow that to be done. Uh, but it was very effective. Um, in the spirit of recapping uh, this intersection between strategy and policy and technology and politics, um, here are just seven, eight things. This vastly improved uh, surveillance that Jim had a lot to do with, understanding their operational patterns, the precision deep strike, deep strike weapons, I'll, you can read them all. I think I've mentioned them all. Um, but those really did unlock the, unlock the new strategy that, uh, that won. Um, it was curious to me at the time, and has become more curious since then, how that all worked politically. The political context was anti-nuclear sentiment and freeze movements and and there and and there were many cycles of this strange um, phenomenon where these technical developments and new operational plans enabled by them would be discussed with politicians and the politicians the in particular West German parliamentarians would discuss them with other opinion shapers in West Germany and in NATO and the ideas would be in a low fidelity transmission um, discussed and ex uh, exposed to public scrutiny. Publics would respond. They would go back up that chain and be reflected to some extent in, the, in, in a readjustment of the boundaries around which NATO strategy would be politically acceptable to publics. And and then to some extent implemented. Uh, that was augmented by the high-level group and a group that I chaired, which was involved more with the details of the operations and in particular the problem of taking weapons out of garrison and, and getting nuclear release early in the, early in the war. Um, uh, but it always seemed to me and still seems to me that the political utility of those developments was greater than what an analyst would say 
the actual military utility was. Uh, there's, a, there's a PhD thesis in political science there somewhere for somebody uh, that I think would be useful to understand because it really was a dynamic that was, that was displayed over and over again, and it was effective. Uh, I think maybe my, that's my last chart. Uh, I have a few charts later that speculate on how we might go, how we might take lessons from what I've just tried to describe and what Jim will describe and carry them into the future. But let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Rich. Interesting. We're going to talk about a lot of common people, I can tell you that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I, as, as Rich mentioned, I have no view graphs, and so uh, I would prefer if you, uh, if I make some statements which you don't understand or question, that you just interrupt me and we have a discussion. Uh, I broke my talk up into two pieces, and um, the first piece deals with uh, the subject of air land battle, Europe, uh, up through the fall of the Soviet Union in uh, uh, 1989, 91 through 91, um, and what role air land battle had in that in that uh, uh, demise of the of the uh, Soviet Union, and uh, I'm going to talk about the history of that, the policy of that, and then talk about how the technology contributed to that. So that's the first piece, air land battle uh, up through the end of the Soviet Union, and then I have some observations that I'd like to give you about how, in general the themes that went along in airland air battle applied to the, to the uh, situation that we have today. And uh, it, it, Rich will be nice to know, you'll be nice to know that I'm consistent with everything that Rich says. <laughs> we approach it from a very different point of view because I'm, while I've been in the military, I'm basically a technologist. Uh, let me start with the history. I go back to uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and it's one of these kind of idiosyncrasies of history. Uh, back at the end of World War II, in the early, early, late 40s, early 50s, Eisenhower was sac -ure, and he was asked the question, as we ended World War II, uh, what is it going to take to defend Europe? And he laid out what he thought it would take to defend Europe. The number turned out to be something like 92 divisions it was going to take to conventionally defend Europe. And he sent his paper uh, to his superiors. Well, one of the people who got his papers was Dwight Eisenhower the president. And as sometimes happens in history, you end up writing letters to yourself uh, about what should be done. I remember when I was in, uh, there was a thing called the track, and I ran the R&D operation of the track, and I wrote a letter to the director that he didn't have his, he didn't have his R&D program set up properly. Director of DTRA. Properly, the director yeah. of DTRA. And so when I became the director of DTRA, that letter was prominently placed in the middle of my desk to make sure that I had to do something about it. And so these, these idiosyncrasies of writing letters to yourself happens. Unlike what happened in DITRA, Eisenhower didn't take his own advice. And the thing that he was concerned about was the economic development of the Western world after World War II. So he created the so-called tripwire strategy, which was nominally 20 divisions backed up by a nuclear weapon for you and me. And so we had nuclear weapons at all echelons of the, of the land force. The 20 divisions were to assure that the Soviets were serious about an attack, but the defeat of that attack was going to be done by the nuclear weapons in uh, uh, station in Europe. And that situation was stable probably up to the mid-60s, at which point there were a couple of developments that occurred. Uh, the first one was obviously that the, that the Soviet Union began developing their own nuclear weapons. At the time that he created the tripwire strategy, we had a pretty prominent lead in nuclear weapons. But there were two developments that happened in the 60s which questioned this uh, mutual assured destruction activity in Europe. Uh, the first one is, some of you may remember the two heavy strategic thinkers in our, in our world, Tom Schilling, uh, who, uh, I guess he's still alive now, right? Yeah. Still, still teaching yeah. at the University of Maryland. Uh, he must be in his 90s now. I think something like that. Has a Nobel Prize in game theory related to economics. 
And uh, he was a firm believer in the fact that nobody should ever try to win a nuclear war, that stability was the was the right thing. So he had problems with this idea that we were going to do something different in Europe. His protagonist at the time, passed away in the late 60s, was a fellow by the name of Herman Kahn. And Herman Kahn had the view, by, by the way, uh, he, if you remember the movie Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Strangelove was a composite of Henry Kissinger and Herman Kahn. Uh, what he actually said was Herman Kahn. And, and uh, Herman Kahn had this view that you needed to be prepared to win at all levels of warfare. That stability, which was Schilling's word, was not enough to do the job. And he was particularly concerned about, and I think this is important in this context, about whether the United States actually could be credible in an extended deterrence environment if the real outcome from the United States' point of view was it was going to get into a nuclear war that it could have avoided if it didn't extend deterrence to the European continent. So Herman Kahn's view was extended deterrence doesn't work unless you can win. That's a little bit oversimplified, but that's where he was. So that was one vector. The United States was having trouble with this idea that it would guarantee a nuclear release in Europe. The other vector of difficulty came about from primarily the Germans. And uh, I remember I had a mutual friend of a fellow who I'm sure some of you know, uh, Manfred Werner. Manfred Werner at the time was in a thing called the planning staff, planning stab. That was the, I guess, the policy shop of the German MOD. And uh, I was asked to give him a briefing on what we were working on that I'll outline for you in, in the near future on um, approaches to conventional defense in Europe, that's what we called it. And he listened to it, asked no technical questions at all. And by the time we were done, he, his response was completely different than what I had expected. And he said, you know, in the alliance, um, the alliance reserves for the individual nations the, the right to disallow the use of nuclear weapons on their terrain. And he said, the United States should not assume that we're going to allow for release of nuclear weapons on Germany. He said, we're used to the Huns invading us for centuries. We lived through the Romans invading us back around the time of Christ. We're still here. And we're not sure we're prepared to turn Germany into a vast nuclear wasteland in the process of trying to defend it. So we need a new strategy. And the kind of thing that you're preparing for is the kind of thing that might be the, the, the approach to doing that. And so we support the kinds of things that you're talking about. So we had a good uh, rapport with the, with the German government and der German planning staff. And uh, that, that didn't always translate into NATO, but, but certainly the, the member states were really concerned about this all-out nuclear war in the 60s, uh, in the, uh, 60s and 70s. So uh, the combination of Herman Kahn's policy issues, Herman Kahn, by the way, was an advocate, just to give you the way he thought, of missile defense, because he thought that, that uh, causing the other side problems and trying to win was the real objective. And he was in favor of conventional defenses, uh, he passed away in 69, so he didn't know any of the specific things we were talking about. But, um, but he was in favor of in increasing conventional defense in Europe and, and uh, extended deterrence. The situation was bad enough that uh, Senator Sam Nunn wrote a monogram for the Senate, published in the Senate, it's written in uh, the 70s, called uh, Will the Alliance Survive? And it really questioned the the uh, ability of the alliance to pull together in a war in Europe to be able to beat the Soviet Union in an alliance, in an alliance fight. And that's where the situation stood, uh, probably in the mid-70s. Uh, as Rich mentioned, and I think, I think um, um, uh, this is something which really needs to be thought through, uh, if you decide you're going to make a fundamental change in policy, it's a decades-long proposition. It is not something that happens. It takes a long time to see the problem you're trying to solve. It takes a long time to develop the solutions. And it takes a long time for acceptance of those solutions within the alliance that you're dealing with. And I have some more things to say about that as we proceed through it. Well, we're now at 19, 
late 1970s. Uh, a person who I've worked for over the years was the undersecretary for, I don't know what they called it then, for, for uh, uh, science, technology, and acquisition, or, uh, Bill Perry. And, and Bill Perry was a big advocate of the work that Ditra was doing with regard to the alliance. And I'm going to use his summary of, of uh, the technology and give you a sense of how it, how it operated. Perry boiled it all down to three very simple technological advances that were the root of airland battle. And I'll try to give you the, uh, the interlinking of those and how they actually determined airland battle. Um, he called it stealth, precision, and speed. Stealth, precision, and speed. Um, stealth and precision are kind of um, self-explanatory, although I'll go through them in more detail. Speed really had to do with being able to disrupt, be faster, and, and be able to disrupt, get inside. The jargon in the military, this is a Don story, uh, is to get inside the operational timelines of your enemy. And, uh, and that's what speed really refers to. If you, if you actually talk to Don in, in, about any of these things, he felt that the speed issue was the biggest issue of airland battle because we were now no longer, uh, the, the Soviets were no longer able to set the op tempo of the battle. And so if you took the three, stealth, precision, and speed, Starry's view with speed was the essential thing. So now let me spend a few minutes with, with each one of those topics. Stealth. Uh, <clears throat> begin with some fundamentals. At the time, in the 60s, um, the, the exercise of power, military power by the Soviet Union was really in their tank formations and in their land battle formations. So there was no question about the target. And, and as Rich as Rich mentioned, uh, shockwave and other kinds of things, their operational concepts were not a surprise to us. We watched them exercise fairly continually. I'll go back through that at the end of this. Uh, shockwave told us a lot about what they did. And so the topic that you, the, the issue that you had to address with the Soviets was how do you handle their tank battles, very sim their tank formations. That was very simple. Well, the Air Force was not a player. The Air Force's view was, I'm going to win the air battle, and then I'll worry about the ground battle. Unfortunately, the ground battle was over before they could win the air battle. So when you looked at the timelines, that process meant that it was the Air Force taking care of the air and the Army taking care of the ground force. And at the time, there was also one other issue which was kind of rote. I, I, I'll relay a story to you about this. Um, the belief was that only a tank could kill another tank. There was just no way that, that uh, uh, other, you know, bombs dropped from airplanes couldn't hit them well enough. The infantry had some sapper charges and the like, but they were too vulnerable. So the only thing that could kill a tank was another tank. I remember giving a, a, a talk, I, I mentioned Manfred Werner. I briefed the German military, and I had two subjects that I was talking about. They were related, and it was night, anti-tank. And some of you may remember the tow missile sites and all these kinds of, of devices. And so I, we gave him this speech. And um, he didn't, uh, this is a, ge a German uh, general, didn't say a thing. He got done and he, he told his translator, tell him this, he says, first of all, no honorable gentleman fights at night. And if you remember the armies, I mean, at 6 o'clock, you got into your mess dress, you went to the officer's club, and the war was over until 6 o'clock the next day. And, uh, and I'm not joking. I mean, and that was the case in Vietnam. And they absolutely, the tankers, the, the tankers just refused to accept the fact that they might not be the primary force on the battlefield. And so they were convinced the only way you could kill a tank was another tank. Well, DARPA comes along and, and with the Army and shows two things. The first thing is not only can we kill a tank, but we can kill them by the handfuls. And we can do that at hundreds of kilometers. That's where the term deep strike came from. That's where the term follow on forces came from. And 
a part of that activity was the fact that if you had a stealth airplane, remember the F-117 was one of the few airplanes, A-10 is another example, one of the few airplanes that didn't have an air-to-air -air mission. It was a ground attack aircraft. And the purpose of the F-117 was it could fly through the air defenses of the Soviet Union and attack ground targets deep into their air defense space. All right. So the ability of precision guided munitions to hit tanks, the ability to bring the, uh, to bring the um, precision guided munitions to arm every individual with an anti-tank weapon, and furthermore, to attack them deep into their, into their second echelon, was the terminology, as Rich mentioned to you, was the key to how you would neutralize the power of the Soviet tank armors. All right, and so that's where air land battle came from. This was the first time that the, that, that the Air Force and the Army, Don was starry, was the Air Force rep, John Wickham was the chief of staff at that time, uh, got together with Charlie Gabriel, and they put together the doctrine of air land battle in which the Air Force would immediately be in play to help the army with the land battle, and that it could do it deep into the uh, enemy airspace. I'll come back to that subject. So words like follow on forces attack, air land battle, deep attack, all those descriptors were based on this ability to attack the, the, um, the uh, Soviet Union formations before they could be presented to this thin defense at the so-called FIBA, don't even use the term anymore because it's no longer relevant, forward line of troops at the FIBA, forward edge of the battle area, that they could be attacked before they could even get there. Now, let me talk about, so that's, that's where PGMs played, that's where stealth played. Now, let me, let's talk a little bit about speed. At the time, the Soviet Union felt that they could disguise their operations, and they tried this, so that this thin force couldn't be marshaled against their point of attack. And so they, um, they decided that what they would do was exercise deep, and they thought they could even, in some cases, they believed they could attack certain certain geographic positions and do that underneath the nuclear umbrella. Present the United States with a fait accompli, strike quickly, Spetsnaz was part of that, take over positions, and they could fight underneath the, uh, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the nuclear umbrella of the United States. And so this issue of operational timeline became very quickly, very important because the speed at which the speed at which a tank army moved was very important. If you allowed them to be able to take over their military objective before you could put your defenses together, you lose. What Starry understood was, if I, can, if I can know what their direction of attack is, and I did that through deep sensors, J-STARS was an example of that, and I knew the directions that they were going to attack, I could blunt their timelines before they could ever get to the target that they were after. That's what the story about, about, um, about inside operational timelines was associated with. All right, so the sensor business was the, was the fundamental behind how do I understand what the Soviet attack strategy is, how do I understand what their timelines are, and how do I blunt those timelines? That's what speed was all about. And as I mentioned to you, Don Starry believed that it was the speed issue, the ability to understand their, their operational uh, objectives was the real thing of air land battle. So let me, let me, uh, let me, uh, now summarize with regard to this history, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Um, some of you may remember Marshal Gorkov. Uh, he was, he at the time, this is now the 80s, uh, was the marshal in charge of the military part of the Warsaw Pact. He was not a politician, he was the, he was a, a, a German, mar a, a Russian uh, general. He became the Chad, the chief of defense, the chief of staff of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Russian military and, and Soviet Union military. When Rich mentioned shockwave, uh, 
the thing that we got, one of the things we got out of Shockwave was we watched the Germans exercise against the concepts that I talked to you about. So they developed this thing called an R RSG. The translation of it was Reconnaissance Strike Complex. And it was J-STARS and stealth and precision guidance integrated into a system which they put together as an RSG. And we watched them, and so they in effect did a red force, which was us, against their forces. And we knew Gor Gorkov's conclusions to those exercises was they could not beat the RSGs. They could not win the timeline battle in the RSGs. And so by 1980s, the, uh, you know, we had done some negations of some of their strategies. We'd taken out their air defense systems. We now have an S-300, S-500 trying to respond to stealth. We took out their, all their air defense systems, both inside Europe and inside uh, former Soviet Union. We negated, without having to go nuclear, their tank armies, the seat, of their, the seat of their power. And we could do that at not all that, at, at long ranges and not all that risk to the number of people that we had. And our Gorkov knew that. And that was one of the contributors to the fact that the former Soviet Union saw that it was going to have trouble being able to defeat the West. And so here's Eisenhower, minimal defense, maximum economic development, being able to show that technology, when married with proper operational tactics, deep strike, phoba, uh, uh, could in fact defeat somebody who invested more money into basic military operations. Now, as a, as a parting shot on the history, one of the things that I always get a big kick out of, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you remember Reagan's Star Wars speech. Um, some of us have a mutual friend by the name of Vic Reese who was on the president's advisory staff during that time and wrote some things. In the, if you read President Reagan's speech, some of the concepts that Rich and I talked about are in that speech. Now, you probably, when you listen to this, it's a little bit complicated as to how you actually use conventional forces, back them up with nuclear forces. So when you read the speech, some of the, you don't get a lot of detail in it, and everybody understood missile defense, so it became the Star Wars speech. But there were a lot of these things that were in his Star Wars speech. And so I would just suggest to you that one of the properties of a, of a technology married with policy is it really does need high level backing in order to be able to make it work all the way up to the president, certainly through, as Rich mentioned, the senior military people. And uh, if you don't have that, technology becomes just another thing in your quiver. It doesn't have the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the power that it could have. So, so my summary with regard to the history, and I hope this was clear, my summary with regard to the history is the marriage of a policy problem, a good strategy, and technology, when they're put together in resonance, can create very synergistic and quote unquote revolutionary kinds of of, uh, of effects with regard to uh, uh, military operations. That's the theme that I, that I would like to leave with you. I think I'll stop there with the history. Now, how would you like to proceed? Uh, we might even take a break. If you're... Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That... Not some, of, some of the pony folk may not internalize this. You're used to thinking of an American military that is the unquestioned dominant military in the world. But don't think that way. In 1978, when I went to the War College, every single army officer, these are guys coming off battalion command, was convinced they would lose in Europe. I so seldom need this. Uh, <laughs> every, uh, every single army officer was convinced that they would lose in Europe. Um, we were madly trying to beef up conventional forces by inducing our allies to spend more money. Um, 
a process that goes on to this day with roughly the same amount of success. But the point is, this is not just a story of a, you know, sort of an interesting thing. This is a story of a revolution that changed the military situation as seen by the guys who would have died from we'll lose to we'll win. And the, if you want to see some of the power of it, what is it that the Navy and the Air Force are calling this hokey, I mean, this well-designed concept <laughs> for uh, Operation Men? They're calling it air-sea battle. Right. And that is not a coincidence. The second thing that you ought to think about, because it's another thing that is a different world. You just notice you had really two wonderful presentations. And let me suggest some words you didn't hear. Joint staff, JCS. <laughs> right? Because prior to Goldwater Nichols, all of this was done at the service level. It was a big deal that the Air Force and the Army got Absolutely. together on this. Absolutely. And it depended on individuals. The Navy was busy off planning for an entirely different war I was helping. Um, it would have been an interesting war. It had nothing to do with that war. Um, and... And so you need to think as you try and draw these lessons forward, the first, that this really was a kind and we thought we would lose. I mean, nuclear weapons weren't there because we liked the idea of nuking. They were there because we thought that the Soviets would be at the damn channel in two weeks uh, if we didn't use them. So I want you to have the sense of how important this idea was and then also, as you try and map this forward, you do have to take account, Rich mentioned uh, one different aspect, the relationship between um, industry and, and government has changed. I would argue the amount of thinking industry does has changed Absolutely. pretty substantially. Uh, but also, the organizational structure of government is very different because of the Goldwater and Nichols uh, thanks. Yeah. Jim, Jim mentioned, I mean, I just have, let, let me tell you what I'd like to do for the next hour um, is devoted, we'll take a break in a minute, but uh, devoted to uh, thinking about what this might mean for the future. Uh, and I've got five slides, and as Jim often does, he will say better without slides than I say with the slides, but we're going to start with my slides. Um, but I want to go back and say a word about Ronald Reagan. Um, I came into the Pentagon as a nuclear weapon guy. Uh, and I thought there was a lot of, uh, that, that nuclear weapons were a crucially important thing. Uh, and they were. Uh, Ronald Reagan had a better understanding of how the anti-nuclear sentiments in America and Europe played in the politics of deterrence and assurance than anybody else because he didn't like nuclear weapons at all. I think there's a lesson there too for us nuclear guys. Um, you gotta, you gotta think about how you gotta honor the sentiments of people who don't like them. Let's take a five-minute break. That'll mean ten minutes, but let's try for five minutes, and then come back and see what this means for the future.
Well, that part was easy. Um, and so I will screw up my courage and walk you through five slides quickly. They deserve five hours, uh, but I'll try to do it in a minute a slide to just stimulate some thinking on your part uh, about what all this means for the future. So let me see if it, this thing still works. Well, some lessons. Uh, first point is obvious. Um, the thing I learned late in life was uh, that the real problem uh, that NATO was facing was losing politically, even if, even if we didn't lose a war, uh, to, in effect, end up in a political situation as if we had lost a war, as if extended deterrence had failed, but it hadn't. Um, and alliance cohesion is what it's really all about. Uh, <clears throat> somebody said it better than I will say it, but that uh, given, a, given a particular military posture, your adversary will take an, an own side conservative position and your allies will take an own side conservative position, which means that uh, he will, he will uh, be deterred uh, if he thinks you're only 10% as good as you, as, you might be, as you appear to be. And your allies uh, will not be assured unless they're con convinced that you're 90% as good or maybe 110% as good as you, uh, as you might be. <clears throat> I think it's really important to plan several moves ahead. I think that the story that Jim and I just told involved people anticipating about a move and a half ahead. Uh, but I think the extended deterrence problems in the future, in particular, the one I want to focus on in a minute, China, is going to take longer. And there are going to be more moves, and the moves are going to have more dimensions. And so we're going to have to think ahead rather than be responsive, in part because of some other side that I have. I don't think we're going to have either military dominance or economic dominance as we had during the Cold War. Uh, forward deployments are really important. Couldn't have done without them. Burden sharing, uh, which, which took a, a kind of a financial, I mean, it, it, it had to do with uh, allies paying their fair share of, of a financial burden. But the reason it was important for them to pay their fair share is, was political. That, uh, that America would feel, that, our, that the American public would feel that they were in it too. And, and the allies then could count on us more if they felt that our public was supportive because they were paying their share. Um, it's hard for an old nuclear weapon guy to say minimizing the role of nuclear weapons as much as possible, but I think that's really important because, because as Ronald Reagan understood. Um, and a, a thing we didn't mention much, but, but, but was important, is, is that the allies have to be involved in the details of the military planning. Now, they tried to be more involved than we ever wanted them to be or ever let them be. Uh, but that was, in some ways, the, the uh, demonstration of uh, cohesion, that, that we're all in it together, uh, was their desire to, and our willingness to, uh, let them see quite a ways into the planning, especially with regard to nuclear weapons. Um, all right, now I want to, I've got four slides. The first two are on similarities between extended deterrence and the Cold War, and I am picking Asia. We may need to extend deterrence in some other places. Uh, and when I say Asia, I really have China in mind. Um, so I think a political move-counter-move -move model is going to be relevant. Strength of economies will make all the difference. That's what won the 20th century for the US, uh, but we may not be able to rely on it in the 21st century. Um, uh, the higher the political and economic stakes, the higher the geopolitical stakes, the more relevant nuclear weapons are going to be. And when they are relevant, the story that Jim and I have told will be the way by which their relevance will be expressed and translated politically um, on the details of how the strategy, uh, how the fighting strategy might be implemented. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, extended deterrence and assurance will revolve around internal politics. Publics will be ambivalent about being defended by nuclear weapons, which will be exploited by adversaries. Um, important to involve them in, in the details. And uh, uh, both forward deployment uh, in peacetime, but also a crisis and, and wartime moving forward uh, will be very, very difficult. Uh, First it'll be too soon, and then it'll be too late. It will be perceived to be too soon, and then it will be too late. Um, 
to me, a concern. I almost hesitate to say this because I don't think I want the idea to become part of the conversation. But to me, the most important reason for keeping DCA in Europe is to maintain the principle that the United States can deploy nuclear weapons outside its own borders. We are the only country on the planet, as far as we know, that deploys nuclear weapons outside our own borders. And I think that is an, a very important principle to sustain. Um, it's more important, perhaps, in Asia than, at least in the near term, it, will, it, it is in Europe. But the reason for sustaining it in Europe is so that we can sustain it as a principle. Uh, the next two slides are on differences. And it occurred to me last night that the most important difference, really, is that in 1980, we were only 35 years away from America having sacrificed half a million soldiers and sailors and, it, and one GDP's worth of national debt uh, in World War II. And by 2020, we're going to be 80 years away from that. And it will be ancient history, not, not, the, uh, uh, not part of people's personal experience. And that was really the commitment, the evidence that America was committed to Europe or committed to some other part of the world, is that we had spent half a million lives and, and one GDP. Uh, and it's going to be a long time. I hope we don't have to give that evidence again before we have to deter uh, again. But I think that will make all the difference in the world. We, there's been a lot of talk about the Syria thing, about American credibility. A lot of it is because that time of American sacrifice is receding into the historical past. Um, China is not the Soviet Union. Um, Andy Marshall sponsored some work uh, years ago, maybe still is, uh, interviews with Chinese general Mike Pillsbury um, wrote a book called Conversations with Chinese Generals. And one of them said, um, you guys had it easy, you Americans had it easy with the Soviets because they were trying to emulate you. Um, we are not going to try to emulate you. So we'll be doing things in plain sight and you won't understand what they are. Uh, that worries me a lot. So China is not the Soviet Union. Japan, Japan is not the FRG for a lot of reasons that you could say. Uh, the Cold War was kind of a central thing. Uh, there, the, there may be other places as charged uh, in the world as where we may want to deter um, in Asia. Uh, Pacific's wider than the Atlantic, literally and figuratively, you know what I mean. Uh, in some ways, uh, the Cold War was driven by ideology. Um, the ideology may not drive it as much in, in the future, and therefore the stakes will seem or be lower, and when the stakes are lower, nuclear weapons seem less relevant. And I don't know exactly how to play that. I mean, there's a self-equilibrating thing going on there that, uh, that we need to think through. We may not be economically dominant. Um, an obvious difference between what Jim and I said in the future is maneuver warfare on land is not going to be the, the military paradigm. Um, Air-sea battle um, is, is, and you know, there isn't a long history of large scale, by large scale I mean, you know, the Battle of Stalingrad, um, large scale land battles. There is not that history of large scale air-sea battles unless you think of the Pacific, the World War II in the Pacific as being one of them, and maybe that's not a bad analog, but it's, but it's obviously not very, not very close. Um, our partners in Asia won't be linked the way the NATO nations were linked, um, because political cultures are much more heterogeneous in Asia. Uh, WMD terrorism was almost not, I mean, there was a concern about nuclear, US nuclear weapons being stole, stolen, but, um, uh, but I think, uh, it could play a bigger role in the future than it ha did during the Cold War. And many other things are more salient compared, uh, you know, cyber warfare, uh, cyber attacks can become weapons of mass destruction. Space warfare is crucial. So there are other large pieces of military uh, consideration that are going to be on the table in the future. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm very conscious that this is a, 
a uh, very sparse and inadequate list of, uh, of ways in which we might think about the implications of what we said about the past for the future. But there it is. What do you all think? Jim, what do you think? I mean, what lessons should we take into the future? Well, I'll give you some ideas. Um, the first thing is what's the same, and the second thing yeah. is what's different, yeah. right? And uh, let me let me spend five minutes or so, so we have some time for discussion on what's the same and what are different. First of all, let me read two quotes to you. I have a friend by the name of Fred Wickner. Uh, Rich mentioned him, and I spent some time with him, and he's big in this kind of thing, but he gave me some interesting quotes. See if you can figure out who said this and when. Uh, be careful above all things not to let go of atomic weapons until you are sure and more than sure that other means of preserving the peace are in your hands. Conrad Adenauer. Winston Churchill said it. Winston, Winston Churchill said it. Okay. Right. Said it in, in, in 1953, something like that. And it was quoted by uh, Margaret Thatcher in, in her address to the Congress in 95, uh, something like 85, excuse me. Another quotation, this is harder to guess, but I think it's also important. Uh, so let me not play the guessing game. Uh, Paul Nitze, uh, 1995. Uh, it's important that we understand both the effectiveness and the limitations of strategic and conventional weapons. All right. And if any of you are reading Jim Acton's book from the Carnegie Foundation on precision global strike, pre what is that? Isn't that the name yeah, of it? Yeah. PGS? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prompt Global Strike, excuse me, that's what I was looking for. Uh, keep, keep. Uh, there he is over there, by the way. I mean, you can take, uh, uh, take whatever credit for it. I didn't see him. Want to, Jim. Good. Uh, keep that thought in mind, because I think that book tried to get at those kinds of issues, and, yeah. it's, and it's an important thing. So what's the same? I, I don't see, and I don't know whether this is good or bad, I don't see, as Rich didn't see, a replacement for flexible response and extended deterrence. I don't see a, a, an alternative strategy. And these two quotes point out the trades that one has to do to be able to preserve uh, uh, those, two, those two theories. So right now, the policy position seems to be the same that we had in the Cold War. I'm not sure I consider that to be a positive. And I, I, I do that because I think a comment uh, that Linton made, um, let me just point out a fact. Airland battle, FOFA, was not originated in the Department of Defense. It was originated by a bunch of different thinkers in the industrial base outside of the system and tried to convince people that they were right. The role that the government played, the role that the government played was twofold. The first thing is it made the investments in the technology, something that was very important. And the second thing was they experimented with it a topic that we don't do enough of today, they experimented with it and determined that they could apply it and that it, would be, that it would be useful relative to their other concepts. So let's be clear that we probably have extended deterrence and flexible response only because there's no innovation going on outside of the system for all the reasons that were mentioned about what some new concepts would be. Uh, I'm, I'm critical a little bit of prompt global strike for one kind of fundamental thing. Until some of the thoughts that were here, there's no policy wrapped around prompt global strike. There's no operational concept wrapped around prompt global strike. It is simply a technology demonstration program. And I, as I tried to point out in the initial part of this discussion, uh, if you just do technology divorced from operations and policy, you're not going to have the resonance that you want. And I'm afraid of that for prompt global strike. So we're still with the same policy. The second thing that's common is we still are relying on technology, technology to be our discriminator in world affairs, in military world affairs. And I, I will just give you one comment on this very quickly. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Leon Panetta, when he addressed the Secretary of Defense, when he addressed the uh, Defense Science Board, current policy, the United States will be the most technically dominant force in the world on the planet, he said. And he was asked, why don't you, you don't mean technically, why don't you just take the word technical out of your discussion? You just want to be the most dominant military strategy in the world. And he said, it's very clear, the word was there for a purpose. 
And that purpose was, we can, if we took technology out, the military will come back with numbers. And you name numbers any way you care to. Numbers, people, tanks, ships. We can't afford it. And so if we are not the technically most dominant force, we're going to be in a, in a, in a, in a very difficult position. So we're still betting on technology. And I would make comment to you that if you look around at the globalization of the, of the technology base and the STEM situation, maintaining technical dominance is going to be much harder in the early part of the 21st century than it was after World War II. And I mean, you can begin to see some leaks. I mean, uh, space dominance no longer as guaranteed as it used to be. Um, uh, the whole cyber realm. One that I'm particularly concerned about, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, is the combating WMD business. I mean, how to make a third world power into a first world power, just give them a lot of WMD. And there are people who, who, who are trying to do that. All right, so those are the things that are the same. Dependence on technology, extended deterrence, and both of them have some problems with them. What's different? I, I start off with a point which Rich talked about and Linton talked about. I don't see that we believe, that the nation believes, that it is into an existential fight today like it did during the end of the Cold War. And as Linton pointed out, it was existential from the PFC on the FIBA in, on the float in West Germany who thought he was cannon fodder all the way up to the, to the president. Well, you don't hear that today. So you don't see the emphasis in the uh, the emphasis on the thought, on the investment for the military side of the equation because it's not existential. You don't see the investment that you're used to seeing in, in military affairs. Second point, we really don't know. It, it was very clear in, in Europe what the center of Soviet military strength was. All right? Uh, not clear in today's environment not as clear in today's environment. And I think that's one of the reasons why we lack, uh, we lack uh, a clarity of the focus that we're on. I, I, I personally believe, uh, these, I'll go off the record for a second, air-sea battle is um, not, an, it, it actually preserves the status quo. And it is not clear to me that that's really the issue of central power for China. Uh, I am persuaded, and this is my, my last uh, comment, uh, since this, the, the, the central focus of military power is not known, it's hard to get to derive a strategy around it. I personally am convinced by Phil Carver's work in one regard, and that is the whole world is going to underground structures. And regardless of what you feel about his numbers of Chinese nuclear weapons and so on, you just cannot deny the importance of underground structures as a important investment on the part of the Chinese, on the part of North Korea, Iran, so on. We don't know how we're going to deal with that. Right now, the only real option that you have, and I, you know, I'm a big fan of silver bullets, but, uh, but it's not too hard to run a calculation to show how deep you have to dig in order to be able to make sure you can't handle it with a conventional weapon. And you can't take them as idiots. So they know that you have a problem with, with the straightforward solution to, to, uh, to uh, uh, underground targets. Now, maybe cyber will give us an out, but we don't know how to deal with that problem. And it represents a huge investment on the part of the, of the uh, of potential protagonists. And it is an investment like tank armies and like, and like air defense. The other thing which scares me is, um, Right now, the agenda, my, my opinion, I read this with uh, Therese Del Pesce, in Therese Del Pesce's book, and I, and I really believe it. The agenda today is being set by the third world. It is not being set by the first world powers. I mean, the simple example of that is, is um, uh, you know, we can't do anything in the, in the um, Security Council in the United Nations. We, the first world powers just neutralize ourselves. And when that kind of thing happened in history previously, it was a disaster. World War I is an example of that. 
Well, what do, what do they do? We have no answer to combating WMD in the broad sense. The idea that we would have to send 100,000 troops into Syria to secure Syrian chemical weapons shows we don't have good ideas. All right? Um, I don't think we really know what to do with, with the, the nuclear proliferation around the world. I don't think we really have examples about that. And if you're talking about the seat of military power, I mean, that's North Korea. It may, may not be only the seat of their military power, it may be the seat of their total power. Yeah. All right? Iran seems to be following course. Uh, I don't know about you, but India and Pakistan scare the hell out of me. And, and uh, so this issue of how, how do, the, do difficulties in the third world blossom out through WMD into major issues of the first world without any control from the first world is a troublesome thing to me. So let me just summarize. What's the same? The same is we still have the same doctrine. Don't know whether it's the right doctrine. Don't see the innovation, but we still have the same doctrine. Number two, we still rely on technology. It's going to be harder, but we look to technology to provide us the aid because we don't want to pay for the other alternatives. What's different, we're not in an existential battle. People are looking at it. They're not as committed as they ought to be. And there are some serious problems in target sets, which are very different than what we faced in Europe, that we so far, and I gave you two examples, underground targets and combating WMD. I can give you four or five others without thinking too hard, that we really don't have solutions to, and there's something that we're going to have to, uh, that we're going to, have to uh, focus on. And uh, they're tough problems. At least I, I don't see the innovation that gets the solution to it. Bottom line, where's the innovation in military affairs? That's, what's, that's what we really need. Enough. All right, enough from us. Let's hear from you all for a while. James. James Acton from the Carnegie Endowment. Um, thank you for an absolutely fascinating pair of presentations and discussions. Uh, and thank you for the shout out as well. Um, one of the criticisms of air sea battle today is that uh, insufficient attention has been paid to uh, escalation risks associated with air sea battle. The fact that the Chinese, um, you know, if they felt their backs were up against the wall and they were in an existential fight they were losing, could result to the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and I would assume that that has resonances to a potential Soviet response to air land battle. Um, you know, if, 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 if given the air land battle essentially flipped the conventional balance in Europe, uh, the Soviet reaction, which uh, I assume would have been to use nuclear weapons earlier in the fight. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, as soon as the Cold War ended, the Soviets dropped no first use and um, openly advertised nukes as a, uh, 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 as a counterweight to conventional. And, uh, and just thinking aloud here, the use of nuclear weapons by the Soviet side during air land battle I assume would have had both very significant military implications. You know, it's one thing fighting on a conventional battlefield, it's another thing fighting on a nuclear battlefield. Uh, and I assume it would have had very significant political implications. I mean, from a German perspective, whether it's Soviet radiation or American radiation that's on their soil probably doesn't make all that much difference. So my question is, how did you think about um, the escalatory uh, the potential escalatory consequences of winning the conventional war in Europe? How did you think about the military consequences? How did you think about the political consequences? And how does, is there a way that that thinking can usefully be transformed into the contemporary air sea battle context? Well, Jim mentioned uh, escalation control and Herman Kahn, and it's a complicated subject, but I, I think we felt that, uh, uh, at least for several rungs up the escalation ladder. I mean, I, that's a complicated idea, uh, but it's still not a bad uh, sort of metaphor. Uh, but for several rungs up the, up the escalation ladder, uh, we, could, uh, uh, we could win. Uh, and, and exactly, you know, the further, further you go up, winning takes on a uh, more and more catastrophic sense. But... Uh, uh, and that that would uh, uh, 
help address the problem of their of their use. And when you get to the very top, uh, all bets are off. You know, I mean, it just becomes a a um, stylized uh, hypothetical situation. But I th I think we generally felt we could win. Um, uh, control escalation. Um, not at the beginning, but at the end of every land battle, I think we felt that we could go several several uh, uh, rungs up the ladder uh, and pose the Soviets with the prospect of not winning. Um, I still think that's not a bad not a bad metaphor for the future, but I'm very much with Jim that in in in, in your saying that um, um, we, we've we've got to come up with new thoughts. Um, I, what I just said is is sort of old thing. Uh, I'll stick with it until something something better comes along. But I'm very conscious of the of the difficulties that it posed during the Cold War, and the fact that it may pose a lot of difficulties in the future. Let, let me give you at least one perspective on the specific question you asked about escalation in Europe. Uh, uh, Linton mentioned the fact that the force thought that it was going to die in Europe. Um, I think that that was true at a time, but it wasn't true universally. And that toward the end of the Cold War, they really thought that, that it was going to be up to the Soviet Union to escalate, not up to the United States. Absolutely. I was talking about the late 70s. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Right. And, and so, in my opinion, and let me be ex extreme, they were not war fighting doc uh, doctrine. They were defensive doctrine and deterrence doctrines that had flexible response associated with them to initiatives that the United States was not going to take, that NATO was not going to take, but that the Soviet Union was going to take. And I think that the, the simple view of it was they had the ability to respond at any level of the battle space and win at any level of the battle space, even to the point of using Pershing II, which in my mind was a very disruptive system to the, to the Soviet Union, of escalation of, of nuclear weapons. So I don't know that I could give you a specific answer to it, except to say that the doctrine was, we're going to win at, at any level. We're going to make sure the Soviets know we can win at any level, and so therefore they won't fight us. That was basically what I thought the doctrine was. And I, uh, Lynn, I, I really believe they believed that. I, I believe the U.S. forces believed that. that uh, the NATO forces believed that they were going to be capable of doing that. And uh, one thing I want to be clear, uh, based on a comment that Clark made, I'm not downplaying the importance of nuclear weapons in this overall flexible response process. It was part of the, it was part of the fabric. That's why I read the Churchill uh, activity. You could get to the point where it would involve nuclear weapons. But they thought they could win at any level. Um, would you comment, though, one of the differences, I, one of the differences, I think, is that since the end of the Cold War, we have evolved a strategy of trying to prevail by disrupting command and control. You look at look at Gulf War One, the idea of disrupting the uh, the buried the fiber optics, drive them into the band where we could find out what they were doing. And if you look at at air sea battle and, and its three tenants, it's the same thing. But I think that where I'm not sure the Cold War gives us a good metaphor or a good model is with the Chinese um, blurring of nuclear and conventional command and control, which some believe is deliberate. I don't know whether it is, but it doesn't sort of matter. You cannot attack conventional command and control, which is what air-sea battle does, without attacking nuclear command and control. And I, I would argue that the decision to escalate to nuclear weapons is qualitatively different in the U.S.-China case than it was in the Soviet uh, case. First of all, there aren't, in Chinese terms, there aren't escalatory steps. There's nuclear or not. That may change. A lot of people think it will change. I don't happen to, but that's not where we are now. So 
How would you apply or would you apply the lessons you've learned to that particular thing, which I thought was what, what James was getting at um, about the particular escalatory aspects uh, of, of air-sea battle, which, at least in the public domain, don't appear to be gamed out in the same way you're talking about the political and operational and technological uh, links that, that you know people like Tradoc were doing. Uh, so talk a little bit about that for us. Well, let's see. First of all, I, I have a, a bias associated with this. Information dominance and command and control dominance, to me, was a key element of air-land battle. It was the only way that Starry could win the, uh, the timeline argument in, in uh, you know, the operational timeline argument. So we got to information dominance. We've been in that for 20 years, 30, 40 years. And I don't think that Starry felt that he was worried about the interleaving of command and nuclear command and control and conventional command and control. His definition of winning the battle and understanding the operational timelines was what happened on the ground and whether he could, he could in fact determine what the intention of the Soviet Union was on the ground. And so I personally don't believe, having talked to him a little bit about this, I personally don't believe that he thought that, um, how do I say this, that nuclear escalation tied with conventional escalation meant all that much because he would have the signals that he needed from the unfolding of the battle to be able to make the uh, to be able to make the proper the proper decisions that's why I put so much emphasis on the sensor part of the activity and not necessarily on the, on the the CQ part of the activity and so I I personally don't think that the structure, I know we have a very particular structure of nuclear conventional command and control. I don't think that structure is as pivotal as being able to keep surveillance dominance, to keep information dominance, to, to, to really understand what's happening on the battlefield, my opinion. I, I, think, I think that uh, it's not quite to your point. I, but let's see. The question of the information dimension of escalation or of war fighting is obviously the crucial one. And um, cyber warfare and space warfare are crucial in that regard. And it's a new thing. I, you know, we had a talk here six months ago uh, about cyber warfare, and we had two people that are really experts. And one of the things I retained from what they said is, we experts don't understand what the strategy is. So I think it's a wild card. I think we're going to have to come up, we're, we're going to have to understand, develop, invent, and test and experiment a strategy for information use, for information uh, in warfare uh, that we don't have today in light of these two big gorillas in the room, cyber warfare and space warfare. Sarah. Uh, I have a question from someone watching online uh, for Dr. Tegnelia. Recently, a former U.S. artillery officer, David O. Smith, wrote an analysis in which he suggest suggested that there was no workable doctrine behind U.S. tactical nuclear weapon applications in the defense of NATO, and hence emerging nations such as Pakistan would be well counseled to work out such doctrine. You suggested the opposite, that TRADOC and DNA had exhaustively pondered the use of tactical nuclear weapons in a battlefield setting. While you not, might not be aware of Smith's article, how would you counsel nations that are or might choose to include tactical nuclear weapons in their arsenals with respect to developing doctrine and capabilities to underpin that doctrine? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. I, I want to be clear about the fact that where we ended up was, I think, the idea of the Pakistanis ending up with tactical nuclear weapons and a uh, no first use prohibition is one of the most dangerous things that exists on this planet. Uh, I think that the uh, I think that the U.S. had a doctrine that they exercised with regard to nuclear artillery. They knew what they were going to do with nuclear artillery. They knew they didn't like it. But uh, what is uh, Oregon Trails? Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with the old Oregon Trails exercises, 
they went through what the operational doctrine was and how, how the United States was going to fight on a nuclear battlefield. They had estimates of what the casualties were going to do. They knew what each part of the, of the nuclear thing was going to play. And I can tell you that the outcome of, nucle of Oregon Trails was it scared the hell out of the Army. All right? So I, I think it's, it, if you make the distinction between what is the strategy, what are the doctrine and tactics, they knew what they were going to do. But the question of whether it was a safe doctrine, whether it was a useful doctrine in Europe, or whether it is a useful doctrine in, in South Asia, I don't think the Army believed that that was the case. And it scares me that the Pakistanis do, because I think it could, in fact, end up with a war in South Asia. I hope that answers the question. I, if he has a follow-up, I'd be happy to see if I, if I deal with it. May I comment on your point? Having sat in uh, shape shock uh, during Wintex's, uh, the selection of the quote strategy, actually tactics, had more to do with trying to fashion uh, an acceptable political use for the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, reference from Joseph Schultz looking for multiple occasions in the different sectors of, of uh, base uh, such that uh, there could be justified to the political authorities because he had to go up through that very complicated uh, NATO command, NATO alert structure to get it done. So uh, there, there may have been doctrine played by the Army, and I'm sure it did scare the hell out of him, frankly, uh, but it, it didn't play that way in the uh, actual NATO Wintex exercises, or for that matter, I would think in the uh, Able Archer CPXs, uh, which were NATO CPXs, as you know. Uh, I had a lot of dealings with Franz Joseph Schultz as well. in. Uh, he ran what third third core the the center center core of Germany, and uh, I know he was he didn't really think that was a viable strategy. You you may disagree with that, but I don't think he thought it was a viable strategy. He Pardon? He played, he played it because that was his job, but when he retired, he was one of the advocates for a new policy in Europe because of the fact that when he played it, he knew that the situation was not a stable, was not a useful, uh, a, a useful activity. And the thing that was interesting about Airland Battle or FOFA or whatever you want to call it was the number of people who had positions in that battle process, in that training process, in that, that, that had the positions, were the biggest advocates for a new strategy because they knew that there was a problem with the, uh, with the way that they were playing the, the, the uh, rehearsals or the training exercises and the command post exercises in Europe. They knew it wasn't going to work. So I don't know whether that answered your question. I, uh, I need more a comment because it was obviously Under no circumstances would the United Kingdom ever use their nuclear weapons. So realism was there, but it just not, was not provided in a military context, a real military context. That was the, uh, that issue of release of nuclear weapons and the fact that the NATO alliance was basically grounded in nuclear weapons was the basis for Sam Nunn's article about is the alliance in difficulty because it was based on some operating principles that people knew were not realistic and that was what he was that was what he was concerned about you know it seems to me uh, that the way you have to develop strategy is by um, working on the problems you can work on rationally and nuclear weapons, at some level, uh, introduce an element of something else. And the art in making military strategy politically useful is to focus attention on uh, the places where operational planning can be talked about in a rational way. Um, and, and you simply deal with, I mean, I think Reagan kind of felt this way, you deal with the, uh, 
with the irrationality at the upper level, these are my words, not his, at the upper level of the escalation ladder by talking about something else. And frankly, I think that's a useful, that's a useful approach. It was, a, I mean, that, that's, that really is, now that I think about it, I think that's what we've been talking about, is we're gonna talk about the things where we, where we have, where, where we can talk about it analytically. And, we're, and we, you can't really talk about the apocalypse analytically. So we, we, just, we just deflected the conversation. And I think that was a useful way to approach it. I have um, to tell you, maybe a, maybe a story to end the, end the meeting on. Franz Joseph Schultz, uh, in World War II, he was a very junior officer. And he was in command of a unit that was part of Hitler's show of force in Munich. And uh, they had this march that they were going to show. Uh, was it McMillan? Was the yeah. McMillan the the might of the of the uh, German armor? And so they marched them past the reviewing stand. And <clears throat> what McMillan didn't know was it was a circular route. And what Schulze did was change the uniforms of his people and marched them around the thing continually. And so, so McMillan never really knew how, how many troops he was seeing or what, what was going on. And so uh, it, just, it just gives you an impression of a lot of this is deterrence and what's in your head rather than what the actual facts on the ground are. I, I, I want to say the last word, and that is uh, experiment. Um, you know, we've we've uh, we've spent the last ten or maybe twenty years thinking about uh, counterinsurgency and uh, and counterterrorism and so forth, and that's what our troops have experimented experimented with, and they and they did a lot of wonderful uh, experiment while fighting. Uh, and so I have some uh, confidence that uh, uh, that if we shift our thinking toward these kind of larger scale scenarios that we're talking about, that we'll be able to experiment again. Uh, the, to me, the, the most uh, uh, amazing uh, example of experimentation was the U.S. Navy during the 19, from 1925 through 1938, when with fleet exercises, first people just thinking, and then fleet exercises in the Pacific, we learned how to, uh, how to, how to harmonize the technology of airplanes and the technology of aircraft carriers, and that was a difficult technical thing, while thinking about how you would fight fleet engagements, while thinking about how you would use uh, fleet engagements to project power across 10,000 miles. And uh, Andy Marshall had sponsored a wonderful book on that history. And uh, that, to me, is almost the epitome. And the Army was doing much similar things with re re regard to land warfare and, and, and armor, uh, the use of armor. Um, but I think we can do it again. Uh, and that's what we're going to have to do. Last word. Thank you Join all. Me and thank you.